Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. You realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world. Also participate on the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is uh, VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night, working from the Shack edition number eight. So uh, we're titling this Shack Tours Unlimited, and tonight we have in the green room, waiting with bated breath, uh, Peter, VK7 PD. So we'll bring Peter in in a, uh, a short while, but I'll... Uh, Firstly, remind people um, they can call in on a range of uh, mechanisms. Uh, the uh, the first mechanism is uh, the YouTube chat channel. Um, so if you're watching this via streaming, uh, then you can call in via that uh, that particular chat channel. Um, and I can I'll uh, I'll uh, we have uh, Warren already on board and uh, Richard. Uh, ZBX, uh, so Whiskey November and ZBX, and also Scott VK7HSE. So uh, good evening to our uh, our already streaming viewers who have uh, left a comment there. So I encourage people to leave a comment and any questions that you've got for Peter, and I'll uh, re relay them on. Uh, you can also call in on uh, Repeater Two One Forty Six Seven Hundred, and also um, DMR. Uh, talk group 3807 so the Tasmanian talk group uh, I'll also be uh, be listing on that particular uh, channel and uh, a quick thank you to all those people who have called uh, called in and also uh, sent me via email and messenger and a variety of other mechanisms there seems to be way too many of these these days but uh, a variety of mechanisms with um, suggestions for what we can include uh, and the like so uh, I'm I I hope I'm including them if I'm not please remind me and I'll uh, I'll see what I can uh, what I can actually do so uh, with no further ado what I will do is uh, uh, just change to our our zoom channel bring that up on screen and I welcome Peter, VK7 Papa Delta, all the way from uh, Lonnie up north. Uh, good evening, Peter. Good evening, Justin. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. How, uh, how was your day? <laughs> Not too bad. I even went out and did a bit of walking in the bush today. Oh, cool. In sunshine for a while. Okay. How was yours? And uh, w w which bit of bush were you dr were you walking in uh, around uh, around Launceston? We went to the Lilydale area. Uh, that's about the limit we're supposed to go at the moment. And uh, 
a little wildlife park called Merthyr Park, which is on Second River, and that's the river that flows out of Lilydale Falls. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. Fantastic. Very nice area. Very nice area it indeed. Was. It was lovely. And we have uh, also uh, Ken, VK7DY, on the uh, on the stream, and Larry, VK7WL8. So uh, greetings to uh, greetings to all of you. Um, so... So, uh, with no with with no further ado, what I might do, Peter, is is get you to uh, give us a little bit of history uh, about yourself, um, and uh, a little bit about yourself, and a little bit of uh, history, and uh, that you uh, you think's relevant uh, relevant to uh, to tonight to kick things off. So, uh, over to you. Yes, well, I think I'm at the age where uh, looking back on my early life is history these days. If you can see the photo on the screen, it's a family shot, and the gawky looking kid on the left is actually me at about 12 years old. So uh, I'll say a bit more uh, shortly about the things I was getting up to in that time related to electrical and electronics. But there's another reason why I put this slide up, because in the background you can see that where we were was fairly well elevated, that was the family home on Talbot Road, and uh, we're looking across at Newstead, and beyond that is Mount Barrow. Oh. Now, if you can't recognise that as Mount Barrow because there are no television towers on it, it's because they hadn't been built at that stage. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> However, that's the site where uh, the late 7PF, VK7PF, Peter Frith, uh, did some experiments with our first repeater, our first amateur repeater in Tasmania, as far as I know, my shack, which hadn't been built at this stage. It was to the right behind the large apple tree that can be seen there. Okay. So it was a fairly good spot for doing some tests. Anyway, he must have been happy with it because uh, we're talking about uh, 1968, I think, at this stage, and it was shortly moved to the Air Services building on Mount Barrow, which was there when this photo was taken. But of course, it doesn't show on the photo okay. here. That's the reason the road was put up and power was on at the... No, the power wasn't on at the mountain. They had to generate their own at that stage. Anyway, okay. that's just a bit of history. So, so, so the, the Air Services building predate, predated everything up there, did it? Yes, um, to the best of my knowledge, it was built in the mid-50s, Okay. and it didn't have commercial power for a while, yep. but the road went up to that and the Flying Fox and so on, and it's interesting, when we had our repeater station there, um, we had to pinch some of Air Services parts, which they didn't mind, because they didn't want them, for reasons you could tell, they had bins of parts, and they were things like resistors and paper capacitors of 1950s vintage, mm-hmm. for which they had no further use, but we were able to use a couple in running repairs, and uh, it's about the only use they've been put to in the past 50 years, I think. <laughs> oh, anyway, fantastic. we're not there anymore. Yeah, cool. That's, that, that, that is... <laughs> Fantastic, Peter. Um, Fairly obviously, uh, I was born in Tasmania, born in Launceston, and uh, that's where I went to school. And uh, in my early life, uh, to the distress of my long-suffering father, I wanted to know how everything worked. The infrastructure, where does electricity come from? Where does the tide go to when it goes out? Uh, Why does water come up a pipe to the tap when everyone knows water can only flow downhill, all those things and uh, one that had me mystified for years was the stormwater drains because I couldn't see an outlet pipe on some of them, why didn't they fill up, so the old man had to try and explain all that to me but at some time uh, in my early school days I became interested in things electrical and decided to do some experiments now I had observed that inside an electric torch, the torch globe only has one spot that makes electrical contacts. Hmm. I hadn't comprehended that the return wire was through the metal reflector and the body of the torch. And the body, yeah. So I thought, well, as the globe gets hot, there must be some relationship with heat and fire. So I dipped a wire in a fire and attached the other end to a torch globe. Well, that first experiment was a failure, but <laughs> undaunted by that, The uh, idea of just one wire and one contact haunted me, so I thought, well, if I use a screwdriver and join the two pins together in an electric plug, 
and put the two contacts of a light globe against the metal blade of the screwdriver, it should glow. Obviously, no one's thought of just using one wire, and that's why they're using two wires, because no one's thought of doing anything else. So I partly unplugged a power plug and put the screwdriver between the two pins. Well, I didn't get as far as attaching the light globe to it, did I? Uh, it was no. a blue flash, and the chunk was missing out of the screwdriver. Well, I hid that screwdriver from Dad for some years. He never did find out why one of the power fuses in the house had blown, but I wasn't going to tell him, was I? <laughs> anyway, at about this time, my parents, in their wisdom, bought us kids, you can see there are five of us there, bought us a set of encyclopedia called The World, World of the Children. Okay. And it had experiments in it and an explanation of electric current that you needed a circuit, which meant two wires, everything was explained, and it had some electromagnet experiments. Oof, okay. So they were really good, and I think those encyclopedia are still around the family somewhere. Yeah, okay. Anyway, at about this time, the next door neighbour where we lived before this address must have noticed that I was connecting up things like light globes. There, oh, there we go. Oh, there we are, later edition. That's Joe Gelston, and we're actually taking um, our repeater off the mountain. So we jumped up onto the mountain I was talking about. Uh, that light globe, which is in our present backyard, is one of the things I put together when I was 10 years old, and I'm still using it. I love it. I don't it. think you can get that sort of figure eight power flex anymore, but uh, the uh, BC fitting there is actually made of Bakelite, which they're not anymore. But mm -hmm. the light globe, I didn't have that sort then. It's a yellow LED lamp, and of course it's to discourage insects. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my first projects, and one of the few to survive. So we went on from there. And uh, the uh, neighbour I mentioned had a son and they were making crystal sets together. Okay. Well, one of them was given to me. There it is. I still have it and it still works. You can see it's a battle scarred. I love it. It has a germanium diode in it. Okay. This was the mid-1950s, and uh, they'd gone beyond using cat's whiskers already yeah. by then, and this was made by the neighbour and a boarder they had called Wall, who took an interest in me, made me that crystal set, and of course I was able to listen to the radio in bed then, wasn't I? The headphones don't seem to have survived, but uh, there's the set itself. Yeah, I love it. Now, meanwhile, in grade four, our teacher... Monica Hampton, whose son is Miles Hampton, head of Tess Water these days, yeah, okay. must have been talking about astronomy, the sun, the moon, and so on. So I offered to make up a science experiment. And uh, I did this using a light globe as the sun. Of course, on the board, I wired up the light globe myself. And I had uh, one of the, um, the globes of the world, the type that shows all the countries and oceans, and it spins around on a, a fulcrum arrangement. And for the moon, I used a white tennis ball on a stand that I made up. And it clearly showed when the earth was in the way of the sun, you only saw part of the moon lit up. Yep. And there was even enough reflection off the white ball to show that the dark side of the earth, when there was sun reflected off the moon, actually lit it up a bit, the there way the go. moonlight does. I love it. So that earned me the nickname of professor at school, didn't it? <laughs> I didn't know in those days that professor is only French or Spanish for teacher, and I had no idea that in t years to come I'd become a teacher. But never mind, the gloss was taken off that nickname a bit by you know, some of the kids calling me Professor Orr because he was in the news at the time, there was a scandal about him, and I didn't find that part so complimentary. Anyway, it went on from there. I was called Professor or abbreviations there on, and that nickname followed me all through school. It didn't follow me to TAFE because, um, largely thanks to Ross VK7ZR, mm. he 
uh, caught hold of my call sign and he used to call me PD at TAFE and uh, that's the nickname that caught on there. Right. So I rather preferred that. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> I don't think that the Mowbray Heights kids had got hold of the story of Dr. Zeus or I probably would have been called a nerd, which is a more fitting description. But uh, that's a term that I believe was uh, coined by Dr. Zeus. Maybe it's just as well it didn't happen. Well, we moved to the address that was shown in there, and uh, one of the things that I did with the, uh, the cooperation of local kids, we put in a magneto phone system. Okay. One went down to Talbot Road across back fences to an address in McKellar Road and the other one went to number 45 Talbot Road. So we actually had a network of four telephones, okay. an earth return, um, steel wire earth return system, worked like a beaut, a little bit of hum on it, and uh, oh, love using it. telephones like that. <laughs> And uh, there they were. So we had coded rings worked out. It took a bit of maintenance because there was some vandalism took place. Uh, jealous kids in the neighbourhood. We had a telephone system that was private of our own. And they used to cut bits out of it at times. I think that my dad had a word with one of them. Told him that uh, he was older than us and he should be... <laughs> should know better. ...to his age, yes. something like that. <laughs> What, Peter, what what did your uh, what did your old man do? What was what was his uh, his uh... various things? Um, he was a house painter at one time. Okay. He managed a service station at one time for the Poxon brothers, yep. uh, with whom he grew up. Uh, and he was a school caretaker at one time. And okay. then his last job was actually working for my ex brother in law, uh, running his car yard. Okay. Okay. Well, there you and go. Dad was in charge of the maintenance side of it. I don't think he sold any cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and you've got a hello from uh, Rex as well. Uh, Rex is uh, watching on the stream, uh, Peter. Oh, I see. <laughs> hello, Rex. <laughs> the, hello, all the other onlookers as well. Now... Ooh. What did all this have to do with amateur radio? Mm. What? Out of uh, playing with line communications and electrical circuits, I did get interested in radio at some time, and I think the crystal set probably helped lead me into that. This is not the exact circuit of one I built, but I did build a radio with plug-in coils that could go on shortwave, very much like, and it did use a 1T4 and a 3V4, but I didn't run it off batteries, I seriesed up the filaments and uh, I had a 6x4 rectifier and a power transformer and it was uh, it had enough gain and enough grunt to run a loudspeaker so it was my bedroom radio <laughs> and one of my early introductions to amateur radio was one Sunday morning and I remember calling my parents in it was after the Sunday broadcast so that started a habit didn't it <laughs> and it was Bill Carter VK7AK then living at Kings Meadows and uh, he had a guest in the shack, in the person of Robin Harwood, now VK7RH. Yep. And I heard them taking part in the callback on a radio very similar to this. Okay. So I think that it went on from there. But I was still a school kid. I was much yep. too young to get a licence anyway. Yep. I was not allowed to build transmitters. I won't say I never did before I had a licence. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. All vicious rumours. That's yeah. another story. All vicious rumours, yeah. <laughs> I built a series of simple regen sets like this, yeah. and uh, it was easier to use. A Notice R3 is a pot, yeah. adjusts the screen volume of the 1T4, and that was the reaction control, and it saved finding yet another variable capacitor, so it was a good way to go. Okay. I built a bedroom radio for one of my sisters, and uh, I think one or two school kids, even. Uh, and uh, most of them were mains powered. Okay. It only cost $3, or the equivalent in those days, to buy a power transformer from Ace Radio. And uh, instead of using battery filament valves that were shown there, 
I used 6SH7s that yep. you could get from Ace Radio yep. or Deitch Brothers in Sydney for two and sixpence each. And uh, even I could afford that out of my pocket money. So that was the introduction to building receivers. During this time too, I, they'd arranged for me to get some work experience with a local company okay. called Lutwich Radio. And uh, they had a radio repair department, yep. service department, and they used to send, uh, throw out a lot of parts. Now, some of the valves still had a bit of life left in them, yep. and there were things like speakers, like, which I found I could repair, yep. and uh, other parts as well. So it was a treasure trove for me. They weren't paying me. I was just there for experience. But after I left school, they were misguided enough to offer me a job. <laughs> So that's where I started off in their service department, and I served my apprenticeship. And of course, that <laughs> led on to greater things. Yeah. Um, um, I was going to say, uh, at that place, two of the uh, staff were then studying for amateur radio licenses. Okay. One was Mike VK Seven ZMH. That's the call sign yes. he got, and the other was Roy VK7ZRG. Unfortunately, Mike's no longer with us, and Roy's let his license lapse. But then after a while, we were joined by Jim VK7JO, who had been living in Hobart for a while. Okay. Uh, some who are listening might remember Jim. And uh, he joined our staff, and uh, he was an inspiration for me, a thorough gentleman, he and his wife, Marjorie, and their two daughters, a lovely family. Well, then Roy left, and we were joined by Bevan, who uh, joined the throng, studied for an amateur license, became VK7ZBW. He's now living in retirement on the East Coast and uses the call sign VK7 Charlie X ray. Mm -hmm. So that was some of my background. Now, with all that going on around me, it's no surprise that I was. Uh, urged, compelled, or felt compelled into gaining an amateur license. So at the age of 19, I sat down and I became VK7ZPD. And I had that call sign for a couple of years before I upgraded it to VK7PD. Okay. So, so Peter, um, you, you, you've talked about, um, and, and you're, you're with... Um, the, the the radio company where, where does where does your foray into your career in education where, where, where does that come from where, when did that sort of happen well while I was at TAFE one of my favorite teachers and uh, people in all the world John Simmons uh, sadly his uh, John's widow died just a few weeks ago okay. but uh, John did sound me out. He said, um, we might have some work coming up. Would you be interested in some part-time teaching or perhaps even a full-time job here? And I said, well, John, if, uh, if you think that uh, I'm capable of doing it and you'd like me to, yes. Uh, I think that it was more so I could work with John. Okay. Well, it was some years before the part-time work came along. I was doing some evening teaching on and off. Uh, for some time. I think that started in 1978, so there was quite a gap. Okay. And then one of their full-time staff left, and I was invited to apply for that job. Okay. And uh, he was uh, one of the, Dennis uh, taught television, colour television at okay. that time. And I'd had some industry training in that by then, and uh, well, it was by Sanyo, and I was state service supervisor for Sanyo for a while. Okay. And uh, then they pulled out, and uh, I worked in an agency doing much the same thing. So it gave me a foot in the door, and I started full-time teaching in 1993, and uh, did that until 2012. Okay. So that's where that came from. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, um... Uh, the picture on the screen, by the way, is on Ben Lomond, and uh, cut in half is Al VK7AN. Yes. I'm in the middle there, yep. and that's Joe on the right, and yep. it was one of our many, many <laughs> expeditions to mountaintop repeaters. So I had to throw that in, didn't I? Oh, definitely. And uh, it's actually fine conditions on that day. You can uh, 
see other parts of the mountain. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Now, I said that uh, I gained an amateur licence in um, what was it, 1965, and I started building my own gear. I built everything from scratch initially, okay. and my first transmitter was using a QQ EO312 in the final. I was asked <laughs> recently what it was. There seems, I don't know if that's happening in Hobart, but around here, one or two people are starting to take an interest in building stuff out of valves again. I'm mm. not quite sure why, <laughs> but uh, I was asked what sort of valve I used in the final. Now, some of my friends that I've mentioned were going for higher power than they could have been, but uh, Joe built this transmitter as well and uh, we got them going together he was still living at home in Westbury in those days yep. but the original design by Electronics Australia also used a valve modulator I didn't do that because I wanted to use mine at our beach house at Lulworth where there was no commercial power at that stage okay. it had to run off 12 volts so I decided to uh, build a transistor modulator for it okay. using a couple of PNP transistors and everything to drive them. I did that very successfully, uh, low power and all. Now, if I go through, that was the type of antenna I used. And that, a double V, yeah. modified TV double B, V, again, Electronics Australia designed to modify it. And it worked on both six meters and two meters, third harmonic, two meters. And the first contact I had across Bass Strait on two metres was in the summer, I think, of, um, of early 1966. And I worked Duncan VK3ZQB, who Rex probably remembers. Uh, that was his original call sign. And he had the ICOM agency. I think that's what he worked on a company called Vicom in those days. Yes, so yeah. I was quite thrilled at that. And, uh, I think that by that time, uh, Ron Wilkinson, 3ZER, Ron Wilkinson Award fame, uh, friend of Rex. Um, but that's the antenna I took with me. It was my home antenna. I could take it with me, set it up there, and it worked on both six and two metres. That was my first bit of DX on two metres. I'd been working some DX and uh, actually heard as far away as Japan my first uh, season on the air on six metres. But two metres was another story, and uh, I think I've had a fascination for Tropo ever since across Bass Strait. Yeah, okay. So, um, yes, that was one of my first successes, and uh, quite a thrill. <laughs> I'm just sorry that I don't have any more gear. Um, forced moves of house, forced changes of, of employment, uh, including the change to TAFE, because... Uh, I found it expedient to go off to university and uh, get an education degree yeah. and uh, I couldn't play much amateur radio at the same time. So what I'm saying, there were a few gaps in uh, my activity on amateur radio, but I came back again and I always planned that when I retired, I'd do a bit more like uh, building stuff for microwaves and set up and... Uh, here I am retired and I'm managing to do a bit of that, oh, not as much as I'd like. Well, well and truly, and m much participation in field days and uh, contests as well. So uh, I, I think you're fulfilling that, uh, that objective. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, in 1968 I gained the new call sign of VK, VK7PD and uh, at that time I bought this. It's the Yasu FT100. You can't oh. see the nameplate from there. Very nice. But I thought, well, if I'm going to go on HF, I'd like to give mobile a try. So I took my car to Sydney, and uh, that was a rather historic event, as it turned Not because I took my mobile there, but uh, I was able to keep skids with Bevan, BK7CX, who workmate I mentioned earlier. Yep. We kept skids every day on either... 40 metres or 80 metres, depending on the time of day. And that was one of my rare forays in HF, actually. Yeah. But while I was there, I, by design, met up with Chris Jones, VK7ZDD, VK2, sorry, VK2ZDD. Yep. 
uh, Justin, you'd remember, Chris, he yes. became the National Secretary of the WIA under the uh, new format. Yep, well and truly. When, uh, Michael Owen was the president. Yep. And uh, Chris actually travelled in my car from Sydney to Wodonga, where I represented VK7, I thought officially, but it turned out to be unofficially, at the first ever VK repeater conference. Okay. Because, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, we were doing some experiments with repeaters in the north, and at that stage, no one else in Tasmania had laid down any plans for putting up a repeater station. So I guess it was largely thanks to uh, Peter Frith and yeah. the fact that he had access to the site on Mount Barrow. Yep. So I represented Tasmania at it, and uh, it was quite well ended. It was a bit controversial. The VK3s wouldn't agree with anything that the VK2s wanted. But I think that Chris <laughs> might have poured some oil on the troubled waters there, and certainly oh, there um, Michael Owen knew how to <laughs> control things, and at the end of the weekend, they did reach a consensus, and um, so I said goodbye to Chris, and uh, drove south to Melbourne, yeah. where I met up with some other amateurs, and uh, again, I think I visited VK3ZER, and uh, it uh, increased the friendship I had with Ken Jewell, VK, well, he became VK3AWK, yeah. and uh, I kept in touch with him for the rest of his life. And uh, because he was in Melbourne, we could uh, keep skids on, on two metres from time to time, although by that time I could talk to him on HF as well, yeah. which we did occasionally. Okay. So that uh, I still have this rig that showed on the screen there. Um, okay. It needs some relays replacing, which I must get around to. I haven't done it largely through lack of interest. But if we move along, just uh, before, uh, before. there's my present antenna farm. Okay. <coughs> Richard has seen, oh, and Rex would have seen it as well. So up the top is a loop Yagi that I bought from Europe as a kit. Okay. And uh, the uh, black rectangular lumpy thing you can see there is the housing for the masthead preamp. Okay. I'm using one of the mini kits ones, works beautifully. Uh, I give good reports to Rex, he can attend to that. And that's what I use in the uh, QSO club every Sunday morning as Excellent. well as other times. But I've uh, worked in, into VK3 a few times using it. Okay. The uh, next Yagi down from the top is the 70 centimetre one and the preamp for that, because the loss isn't as serious in the Ultraflex coax, the preamp's actually in that box for 70 centimetres, okay. and it works fairly well. Yep. I have got a preamp that I can use on the 2 metre Yagi, which is this guy, but I haven't installed it yet because 2 metres are so damn noisy in my place, I don't think there'd be any advantage. So that's, I think, an M squared. Uh, kit six meter antenna yeah. with gamma match works fairly well. I don't think it's quite as good as the Werner Wolf one that uh, that it replaced, but the Werner Wolf one was starting to show its age a bit. Yeah. Anyway, it, it works, and I have quite a bit of fun when there's uh, some sporadic E about. And the vertical thing with the droop radials, I made that myself out of some aluminium, and that's what I use or uh, the FM segment of the six metre band, including okay. the repeater. So uh, that's most of my antenna farm. I'm just in case anyone asks if I've got anything on HF, if you look there, you can just see a bit of thin wire and it's a bit of garden, galvanized wire. And that's part of my G5RV and it goes, drops down towards the front. It's more, it's, uh, yes, it is in inverted V fashion. Okay. And uh, a couple of nights ago, oh, Yes, and it's run by a ladder line, 300 ohm ladder line. Yep. So that's all I've got on HF. But it enables me to go on the sewing circle net once in time. It's as noisy as hell on 80 metres. So I've been using an SDR receiver thanks to VK7GX, okay. uh, Greg at Lagana. Yep. I listen on his receiver because it's too noisy in my place. And, and Peter, Peter, we've got... Uh uh, and, and Andrew uh, VK7 uh, DW and also Steve VK7 OO now uh, on the stream. So uh, uh, a few more. Oh, so Steve and Andrew. Yep. 
Good stuff. Well, moving along. <laughs> yes. A few decades. <laughs> Just a few. The main thing that I'm using now uh, it is 2000X, and uh, that's the one that I, I bought it. Uh, only because at the time it was the only rig on the market that had both 23 centimetres and 6 metres and the bands in between, 2 and 70 as well, they were the ones I wanted and at the time I didn't have any use for HF, I didn't even have an antenna up but uh, then when uh, Joe Gilston and his brother were going on safari, <laughs> as I called it, yep. in central Australia, to the Simpson Desert actually, yep. they were going to use the traveller net and I thought, oh, well, maybe I should keep in touch with them. So uh, that's when I threw up the bit of garden wire, uh, G5RV, and I was able to keep in touch with them on the traveller net, which works very well and I'd recommend it to anyone. I love it. Anyway, there it is. Um, there are the two screens I use on the computer for digital modes. Now, you'll notice my nice tidy shack. <laughs> These are parts of projects I'm working on at the moment. Ah, cool. There's the antenna rotator. There's my digital crow. And there's a, a TYT quad band that I use on the FM channels. Okay. I haven't used it on 10 meters yet, but it works on 6, 2 and 70 and uh, it means that I don't have to tie up the TS2000 if I'm using it for other things. Yep. So that's some of the projects that I'm up to at the moment. So, so now, Peter, Peter, what, what are some of those projects that are sitting there on the shelf? <laughs> oh, yes, um, just uh, bear with me a moment okay. and uh, I'll get on to that. All right, cool. Uh, there's the um, interface that I made up that plugs into the TS2000 and the computer. So all of the digital stuff that I use and the broadcast. Notice there's a slide switch and in the TX posi position there, it puts the transmitter permanently on and I can run the broadcast through it. Otherwise, um, it would only be good for the digital modes. Love it. Now, what else am I up to? Before I get on to other projects, <coughs> I showed you the shack at home. This is my mobile shack. Now, it's not as luxurious as the one used by VK7TW that's all enclosed and uh, nice and snug. This is out in the open. <laughs> and, and uh, well, Andrew can recognise himself there. Yes. That's uh, Ross VK7ALH yes. for those who haven't met him Love before. It. There he is, and um, we, uh, well, at uh, one of the field days we had joint operation okay. so uh, 70 centimeters two meters no uh, 1296 uh, a yagi that i made myself they're a bit rickety there but it uh, doesn't affect the performance yeah. looks as though we're pointing north at that stage so yes that's a dl6wu type design okay. all metal construction and uh I think likewise, 70 centimetre Yagi, uh, that's only the ballon in there, nothing particularly fancy about it, and that's the 2 metre Yagi. Now all of those can be broken in half so they fit in the back of the ute. Okay. Everyone knows that if a boom's too big to fit in the car, you just run a hacksaw through it and then you have to join it back together again of course, but the U-bolt helps. Now that's uh, a Kuna transverter for 1296 megs and I think it runs 25 watts Oh, okay. and you just see the other end of the microphone cord is the good trusty uh, FT817 sounds familiar doesn't it Justin? Lovely, <laughs> lovely rig and there we have the, um, the GPS receiver yep. and the transverter for 1296 the uh, TS the uh, FT817. Uh, I think that uh, you might have put me onto the module for that. Works like a beaut. Yep. Um, also, uh, you can't see the actual transceiver behind the dish, but the 10 gig gear can also be GPS locked, which I do. Okay. Of course, uh, that's Andrew's panel and that's my panel for um, 3.4 gigs. So that's my mobile shack. Okay. Fantastic. And where, where, where are you? So we've got it so tied down with guy ropes yes. so it doesn't blow away. 
Oh, yes. Everyone knows that as soon as you go on a field day, up comes the wind, and uh, we were lucky that this day there wasn't rain with it as well. Ah, correct. So we had to push things back out of the rain. So, so where is this, Peter? Where, where, where are this you? Is, oh, yes, thanks, Justin. This is at White Hills. Oh, and, this uh, is... At the back end of the beach. Okay. We're pointing north at the moment, but, uh, and the dish is actually pointing probably towards Rex. Okay. We, this most likely after we've been talking to Rex on it. So this is White Hills. It's a lousy spot for uh, working into VK3, but it's excellent for talking to Rex and to Mount Wellington. To the south, so yeah, that's, okay. And it's one that was discovered years ago by Joe. Okay. It's better than uh, where, where the commercial radio station used to be. Um, got out of my head. Traditionally known as 70X Hill, it's not the proper name for it. Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, it, it's the best around, and we're still experimenting. We may even go on the winter field day to Mount George. It's not as good for the Hobart direction, but it's quite good to the north. north so yeah. well, that's another job in progress. And, you're, so, and Peter, we've got Herman VK7 HW on. Uh, on uh, on the stream as well so uh, another one oh good evening Herbert <laughs> now another project on the go I'm waiting on the front panel for this 19 inch front panel of uh, I'm waiting on uh, David VK7 JD to cut a rectangular slot in it because he'll make a better job than I would but I'm uh, going to donate this rig it's an FT857 yep to uh, NTARC to put on Mount Arthur as a remote controlled station and okay. uh, that's the uh, Bulgarian 1296 big uh, transverter okay. and there's a linear amplifier a down east microwave yep. one that I put together okay. and uh, it works okay and uh, there are various relays and control things that I haven't put in there but that's a work in progress to go up there we've got Fantastic. a space in the rack to take it all 12 volts operated, yep. so it'll, uh, and uh, we've got various antennas to go up. Yep. Now, another Bulgarian transverter, this is the 2.4 gig one, and inside there is a, a linear amplifier that Richard helped me buy. This case was donated to me by uh, VK3 as XPD. Oh, yes. He gave me that one of the trips to it. And uh, the gear just fitted sort of around and on it, and uh, it's fairly protective to be thrown in and out of the car. And that's one of the crates I use for taking the uh, mobile gear, the field day gear, yep. with me thrown in there. And notice I'm using Andes Anderson connectors for power. Yep. I used to use banana plugs, and uh, <coughs> Joe said something rather rude about banana plugs at one time, so I gained the impression I shouldn't be using them. So I've gone to Anderson Connectors. Now, they're the two yagis I made that were uh, in the field day installation. Okay. I put them together at some time last year. They're uh, on the front yard at the moment, laid out. And uh, as I said, they're deal 6 wu design ones, yep. and they appear to work very well. I've no means of measuring the actual uh, DBD or DBI gain of them, but uh, there's nothing better than a field day for testing things out and seeing if they work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's some of my gear. Now, my other shack, uh, there's Joe. Notice there's one foot off the ground, so he's running as usual there. This is our VK7AN using my FT817. Yeah. And this is the link dipole Lovely. I put together. Very convenient of the uh, of the, the players to yes. put the trig point there <laughs> because it was just the right place and the right height for using as uh, an inverted V link dipole antenna. This is on Flinders Island. I think it's uh, Mount Leventhorpe. Okay. Uh, and uh, we've got some log entries to prove it. It looks as though we were using Al's call sign at that time, but he's pretty good at yaffling on the radio, so uh, that's why he was given the microphone. <laughs> and it looks as though that's a bit of the log sheet there. So that was one of our digs traditions to uh, Flinders Island. Lovely. Now, another work in progress. 
Excellent. This is a transverter to the uh, mini kits design. Okay. Now, it's been put aside a couple of times because, uh, meanwhile, <laughs> the Bulgarian finished transverter was actually cheaper than buying the parts for that thing. But uh, I'll still finish it off sometime and I'm determined to get it going. Yeah. So that's why it is. And uh, I've uh, propped the bits up so you can see what the various boards consist of there. And uh, last but not least, whenever Intuck gets the little tower rotator on the roof of the club rooms, I'm going to donate. That's a slightly bigger loop Yagi of the same design as the one that you saw at my place. Yep. And it was too difficult to take out of the garage for the photo, and I couldn't fit it all in without getting some distance away. So there it is, safely stored at the moment. Okay. And there are some of my field day antennas hanging up. What else do you do with them? And that window is above the workbench that I have for doing things like metalwork in the garage. And of course, the inevitable tangle of coax cables that we all seem to collect. Um, I think that's a 4G, 3G antenna. Yep. Uh, and not the, directly to do with amateur radio. And the Faraday cage, yeah, as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely a bird cage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to put me in. Uh, and uh, <coughs> yes, this is a project that I might share around at time, sometime. Notice two quartz crystals there, and you can just see perhaps the uh, backside of a valve socket there. Okay. So this is part of the valve experiment, and something that I never got around to doing years ago. It's a VXO, a variable loss later. Okay. 12 megahertz, you can just see there. And uh, it, it's possible to multiply it up and cover, uh, I've listened to it, listen to the harmonics on the receiver, cover um, the bottom end of the two meter band, well, the bit that's used for AM, because the idea is to build an AM transmitter. Now, some, another reason why I showed this slide, I thought, where the heck do you get a couple of hundred volts from these days? You can't easily buy power transformers that do that. And uh, it's possible to step the voltage down, step it up again, then you have to rectify and filter. But the cost's almost next to nothing. There's a multi-turn pot there, yep. and this thing can deliver something like between 50 and 300 volts at up to 100 milliamps, Ooh. and you put 13.8 volts into it. I now, every it. shack these days has a supply for 13.8 volts whether it's at home or out in the field. I love so it. that's my latest obsession. Well, one of them. <laughs> and that's the 24 meg multiplier coil. Uh, and the valve, incidentally, if anyone wants to know I'm playing around with, is a 6AK5, because I found that you can buy them from China. Why the heck they're making 6AK5s very cheaply, I don't know. And I found you can buy QQEO312s I think they're new old stock, and some of them might be second hand. Yeah. So, um, okay. There so, it is. So, so, so the 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 two meter the two meter AM um, valve exercise. Um, it, 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 what what's the what, is this a case of um, uh, why do you climb a mountain, or um, <laughs> is there a particular? Uh, uh, net or something that you uh, you want to get onto? What what's the what's the sort of backstory to this? Well, nothing really as sensible as that. I don't think, <laughs> Justin. Okay. Uh, there just seems to be some <laughs> interest in building valve transmitters at the moment. Okay. And I thought, well, I've done that before, and I always liked it. I'm sorry I didn't keep at least one of them, so I'll have another guide and I'll see what's about in the way of parts. Variable capacitors are about the hardest thing come by these days yeah. so I'll I'll give it a go and um, uh, yes there seems to be an interest in uh, AM radio uh, on various bands so well and true. What if, if this one works I might even for the first time in my life build a, an HF AM transmitter okay. there we are <laughs> Oh, that that is um, that's fantastic, Peter. And and you you're right. I, I keep coming across AM signals um, because on on the uh, on the, the 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 spectrum scope um, on the the SDR, um, 
you uh, you very quickly realise that it's an AM signal uh, given it's both sides of the carrier. So um, uh, there, and uh, I I always have the uh, SDR on forty metres, and uh, there are quite a few uh, forty metre AM nets and contacts uh, that happen uh, probably more more than you think they do. So. Uh, so yeah, and there's some. There are some very big forty meter AM signals out there. I tell you. Um, All right. So uh, so, um, and they always seem to be talking about the uh, the, the the fidelity of their microphone or uh, or the like. So, uh, uh, but anyway, um, well that's that's fantastic, Peter. And of course you all. You well, all, I think it must be question time because uh, we're getting on towards the hour. You well, I, I just wanted to to take you back to the FT one hundred. Um, uh, because that's a now, if my memory serves me correctly, that's an all valve rig, isn't it? That's a no, it's a hybrid. Hybrid, okay. Yeah. That that would have been their the forerunner of the FT one hundred and one. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, there he is again. Yeah. So it uses a twelve by seven. Yep. A couple of parallel TV sweep tubes in the finals. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, so uh, yes, the uh, FT101 was an improved version, yep. and uh, of course the 101 went on and ended up having a digital dial on it. Yeah. This doesn't. But okay. this one uses a glorious mixture of germanium and silicon transistors. Oh, okay, okay. So this was must have been their first. This must have been their first hybrid rig, I reckon. Is that would that be about right? Um, I think you're probably right. Because it's, and uh, it was done like that to make it easier to work mobile, yeah. which it did. It, it uh, performed fairly well. The transistor receiver in it, I think, would have uh, lousy cross modulation figures, yeah. but uh, I, I wasn't ever troubled by that because I didn't use it around other people's strong signals. So, that so means in somewhere like Sydney, yep. uh, its performance would be a bit average. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so it must have an inverter or something for the the high voltage if the if it's running yes. mobile. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, and the transistors, uh, presumably germanium, and they're actually physically larger than the TO three package. Yeah. Okay. They're great big mothers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, the uh, mains input used the same. Uh, it oscillated at fifty hertz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. The mains winding for 240 volts, yep. you could get 240 volts out of it when it was working on 12 volts, and I used to run a fluorescent light in the car off it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And and it's and it's um uh, that that's all that's all in the same socket on the back. Is that is that yes that, yes it's one of those <laughs> yes um, um, bladed call it sockets yes. with lots of flat pins pointing in different directions. Yes yes yes. So, uh, Lows, anyway. Uh, dear, oh dear. Um, dear, oh dear, oh dear. So, uh, I just had um, Scott Evans, VK7 HSE, just said, uh, you'll hear my uh, APRS gateway on uh, 7.049, so uh, on 40 metres. So, uh, there you go. He's uh, set up a gateway on there as well. So, you'll hear some uh, some uh, some digital uh, sort of sounds coming from uh, 7049. So, uh, now, I, I, Peter, I just wanted to um, uh, get you to tell us about your uh, amateur radio inspirations because I think you've had some photos of them there. But uh, I, I, yeah, I just wanted you to uh, to let us know who are the who are the people who uh, inspired you in the, in relation to amateur radio. Well, I suppose going way back, uh, part of it would have been when I heard Bill VK Seven AK, and uh, I already knew Seven uh, RH these days because both our mothers were school friends. So the fact that I um, heard someone I knew talking on someone else's amateur radio and then I, th I think that the guys I worked with okay. inspired me to go into amateur radio Roy and Mike and then, then Jim as I said and uh, then of course Bevan kept skids when I had this ring I think he had an identical model at that stage too Okay, okay. Uh, we bought one each so uh, that was it and then in more recent years course uh, 
how couldn't I be inspired by everything that Joe got up to? Uh. He helped get me in the World 96 meetings, certainly stood over me to uh, get me operating with digital codes, which yep. I didn't have a clue. And uh, uh, I've had to hand that burden on to Rex in recent years. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, then in recent times, definitely Rex and uh, Rex has been an inspiration to many in Hobart, Ooh, yeah. including people like Richard and your good self. Yes, definitely. Um, well and truly. Well and truly. Um, and um, and we uh, we reached a, uh, you would have heard on the broadcast, Peter, we reached a milestone uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago and also, uh, I, I think, last week, uh, with... Uh, 23 with on 23. 23 on 23. <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, we, we're—I I think we're aiming for forty-six on twenty-three now. So, uh, so uh, good. <laughs> Aim high. Yeah, aspirational. Um, so, uh, so um, well. Yeah. Partly because we, uh, as you know, Net continues uh, after the QSO Club, and mm. we have the North South contact, which was started off between and Joe talking of inspirations. Uh, I've suggested to the Northern members. We have a concurrent uh, 1296 QSO club on mm -hmm. Sunday mornings here. The reason being, I counted around, and there are at least eight amateurs in the Greater Launceston area that have gear that can work on 1296 megs. Yeah. And how many do you hear on using it? Yeah, well, So I've go. suggested in a message that it might be due to lack of activity and it's time we generated some. So there you are. I love it. See what you've all started. <laughs> I love it. Well, and, and in no no small part to uh, to Rex and uh, and his uh, Yagi antennas and various jigs that uh, uh, I, I think actually I think even the even the jigs have, have headed up north um, uh, to, uh, to that's another story. Dr drill the um, ladies listening. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> um, so so in no small part it's um, the. Uh, the, the the number of uh, yagis that have been built is uh, is enormous and and certainly more than 23 uh, so um, so we we're, we're hoping to uh, to increase that number on a uh, on a sunday morning so uh, so there you go uh, fantastic so um, I, what i might do is i'll put out a call um, uh, I, I put out a call on the uh, chat channel for any questions so shoot those through and i'll i'll just do a a, a bit of a call out on uh, repeater 2 so this is uh, VK7 uh, OTC with our uh, uh, DATV experimenters nights and uh, any uh, questions for uh, for Peter VK7 PD who's on our uh, on our uh, interview uh, tonight over. VK7 Victor Hotel. Yeah, 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 Victor uh, hello, Peter, and thank you so much for a very, very interesting uh, rundown on uh, your history. Uh, yeah, very nice to listen to, and I'm just wondering, uh, my question is, uh, whether or not uh, you plan to use 1296 at some height uh, to go for some records uh, uh, across the ditch. Uh, over. <laughs> uh, so can Vince hear me now? Yes, he can. Go ahead. Oh, good. Yes, well, thanks for the question, Vince. Um, I have had some contacts across Bass Strait from Mount Barrow when I've been on field days. Uh, I think 1296, 10 gigs, 3.4 gigs, uh, but I haven't made any records. So far, I haven't achieved anything that's been, that hasn't been done before. And of course, uh, I've come across some very uh, keen competition with that, haven't I? <laughs> so, uh, yes, the, the elevation, my favourite spot is on the northern slope of Mount Barrow, but I'm not going to go up there in the winter. That's another story that I've told elsewhere. So uh, I'd like to do more of the same. You're quite right. Go ahead, Vince. Oh, very good. Thanks, Peter. And uh, yes, I, I think that you're a, uh, <laughs> a candidate for uh, some uh, long-distance stuff. Um, and 
uh, if you ever get round to looking at a place called Mount Cleveland um, up behind Waratah, uh, if you ever think of going up there, I would be in it with all boots because I think that's probably one of the best spots to uh, uh, point a signal uh, anywhere across the ditch. Uh, anyway, thanks, Peter. Uh, great to listen. Thank you. Thanks for the idea, Vince. Uh, yes, I hadn't ever thought of using Mount Cleveland for that reason, but if I had an ultimate ambition, I've mentioned this to Rex, <laughs> it might be to work a VK6 on 10 gigs. Mount Cleveland that could be a possibility, couldn't it? Anyway, uh, Rex has assured me that it's not as easy as it sounds to do that. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. I might have to get some more power. Okay, I should say over, should I? <laughs> no problems. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vince. Any uh, any further questions for Peter? Over. Okay, nothing heard. We'll see whether there's anything on uh, three eight oh seven. And just acknowledging um, also VK seven RH Robin uh, uh, is uh, on the stream as well, Peter. Oh, thank you, hello, Robin. Oh, so VK, uh, this is VK7 OTC on uh, Talk Group 3807. Any uh, questions for Peter? Uh, uh, over. And another call. Any questions for uh, Peter VK7 PD on our uh, DOTV experimenters night? This is VK7 OTC. No, nothing heard. So, and I, I, I don't have any questions via uh, via uh, the the chat channel. So uh, there are quite a few, uh, lots of people on the uh, the the chat tonight, uh, tuning in via the uh, the streaming. So, uh, so good stuff. Um, oh right. So, uh, so. Um, oh no, hang on. Well, we've gone over an hour now. So we we've got. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. We've got. Uh, uh, one from Robin actually, VK7RH, is that the FT100 I borrowed when I was a shortwave listener uh, over? <laughs> well, it's the only FT100 that I've ever had and I don't remember lending it to him, but I lent it to everyone else. <laughs> uh, people have borrowed it and used it more than I ever did. <laughs> and, uh, some of them have reminded me in recent times, so I would have to say yes, it must be the same one. Fantastic. Well, there, there you go, Robin. Uh, it, it was so, uh, so, uh, and it's it's on the projects list to uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, rejuvenated, I suppose you'd say, wouldn't you, Peter? <laughs> well, yes. It always gave relay trouble because the relays were uncovered. Uh, they were uh, open to the atmosphere and they used to uh, get burnt contact, not burnt contacts, but uh, just uh, high resistance Tarnished. contacts. Yeah. And uh, okay. Ross VK7 ALH has acquired some with plastic covers over. Okay. I must fit them and uh, sort out some other problems that it has okay. and uh, get it going and uh, then it'll be available to lend out to someone else and VK7 AN is wanting to borrow it so he can use it on the bottle shop net. Oh, there you go. I love it. I love it. Well, as as I mentioned in one of our earlier conversations, one of my uh, one of my projects that I I'll get around to at some point is uh, to rejuvenate my uh, my old man's FL50, um, uh, FL50 and FR50. Um, so uh, he, uh, I, I I managed to rescue that and uh, bring it back. Uh, um, and uh, that's that's one of my projects. So that, hence my question about it. Did being, they have a fawny coloured case on? Yes. It? Yeah. Yeah. They. they, yes, they I they, remember them. They were the first of the um, uh, first of the series from from uh, Yezu, which is wh why I asked about the F the FT one hundred being hybrid, because the uh, the uh, FL and the FR fifty are all valve. Um, they they. Yes. They're, they're an all-valve rig, um, so... Uh, I think it was a better... The receiver was a better performer, I think, too. Yeah, okay, okay. 
So, but um, that those th both of those rigs haven't been turned on for probably, I would suggest, in excess of twenty years. So uh, I'm going to have to be a fairly ginger, gingerly about uh, uh, turning them on. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd say that they're fully, fully restorable. Now I have used that combination because on the way back from the Wodonga conference, thanks, Vince. I called in on uh, Daryl, he was VK3ZNC in those days, and he had those radios yep. <laughs> that you mentioned, and I kept that night I kept my skin with Bevan by using his gear because he wasn't licensed to do it. <laughs> so I was able to get him talking to Bevan in, in Geelong using my call sign. Okay. So, well, he did uh, later go out and uh, he got a full call, VK3AQR, and uh, he moved to... South Wales for a while, he's got a different call now. Okay. But uh, yes, uh, that was a bit of a laugh that night. I know, well and truly. Uh, uh, he had he had a better rig, better antenna than me. And, uh, <laughs> Bevan didn't have to strain his ears to hear me using uh, a mobile whip. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And Vin Vince just chimed in there on R two and said the FR the FR fifty was a hot receiver, was a fantastic receiver. So. Uh, so uh, I look forward to getting that back up and going. So it's good, yes. good stuff. I'd say you're on to a winner there. So uh, and uh, uh, using the dock of a challenge. Uh, yeah, uh, well and truly. Um, um, and Warren's just said, uh, "Great talk, Peter. Thank you." So uh, good stuff. That's Warren VK7 Whiskey November. So uh, so uh, well, thanks, Warren. Yep. Cool. So uh, um, well, um, that is fantastic, Peter. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, taking time out of the uh, um, what would I think normally be the technical net up uh, up uh, in Launceston. Um, I, I don't know whether you participate in the, the the technical net that we hear about on the broadcast each week, but uh, yes, yes, uh, I have been. Um, so I, I don't know whether it's still it, it's still going, and you can uh, you can you can join it a little bit later. Uh, but uh, um, thank you very much for your uh, for your time and. Uh, uh, just uh, just stay stay on the line for a little while. I've just got a few things to uh, to wrap up with, um, and then I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll 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 uh, follow up. So uh, what we'll do here is just go to here. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, I just want to do a promo of uh, next week. Uh, next week is our whole of club virtual gathering. Um, and a uh, huge thank you to Scott VK7 HSE and also Clayton VK7 ZCR who uh, have agreed to give a talk on D-Star uh, and this has come out of uh, lots of people have uh, IC9700s um, and the IC9700s uh, have D-Star built into them um, and uh, there was a question about using D-Star uh, with the uh, the IC9700. So, uh, so uh, that's next Wednesday night, uh, the third of June, and you'll see uh, an email uh, come out with the uh, the Zoom details uh, in the next few days. So, uh, uh, and that starts at seven thirty. Um, uh, and we've got a little bit of a rough agenda of that night, which is a bit of intro, a bit of history. Uh, registering to get on to a D-Star because it's, uh, it is like um, uh, DMR. You do have to register and get an actual uh, registration number which uh, goes into the radio. Um, the availability of repeaters around uh, VK7 and then a little bit about the equipment that you can actually use to, uh, to access uh, D-Star. Uh, and then probably the most important uh, bit of it is um, traps for uh, young players. <laughs> Uh, traps for young and not and not so young players, um, and uh, uh, probably li maybe a little bit of a focus on the 9700. Not sure about that, but uh, and I noticed Scott has just uh, said on the uh, chat channel that I <laughs> have still got to download the 9700 manual. So, uh, um, so yes, and thank you, uh, Warren. Yes, uh, I've got uh, lockdown hairstyle and lockdown beard, ISO beard. So uh, I'm I'm cultivating this. Uh, um, and I'm going to be a bit sad when I go to the uh, go back to the hairdresser and have it all cut off. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm wor I'm working on it, uh, Warren. I'm working on it. So uh, so that's our. Uh, I have tangled whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm, I'm living up to the call sign. That's it. That's right, Peter. <laughs> um, so um, for our RF viewers, um, so we'll we'll head to uh, head to uh, um, uh, RF uh, only in a in a sh in a short moment. Uh, but we've got some videos, um, and I thought, given that Peter was the um, uh, was the uh, interviewee tonight, and Peter's uh, interest is obviously microwaves uh, and uh, and uh, above VHF and above. Um, uh, our videos uh, include um, there is a ham radio special event, a 10 gig microwave operational uh, uh, day uh, in America, um, and uh, a few interviews with um, the uh, the 10 gig operators. Um, there is a wonderful one uh, which is an introduction to the X-band for amateur radio. So uh, uh, using a very nice um, Cassegrain dish um, from a very well-known uh, American amateur. Um, then we uh, we move to a couple from Hayden uh, VK7 uh, HH, which is his ham radio deluxe um, ham radio deluxe ham radio DX. Sorry, I'll get that right. Sorry, Hayden. <laughs> Um, Ham Radio DX channel, uh, very popular channel and uh, great videos. So uh, go and check that out. Um, very, the first one is uh, a tour of his uh, Ham Radio transverter for 2.4 gigs for 13 centimeters, and then uh, a revisit to the uh, 2020 Summer uh, Ham Radio VHF UHF Field Day, uh, which Hayden put together a great uh, a great uh, video around. Uh, amateurs from all around uh, Australia um, uh, and contributed to that particular uh, to that particular video and I'm not sure we'll get to this one given the time but uh, there is an introduction to uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 ham radio which is a ham radio crash course uh, video uh, from another uh, another very popular uh, YouTube channel so uh, so that's our videos for tonight so I'll bid you 73 and uh, we'll catch you next week for our uh, our D star uh, whole of um, whole of club zoom online zoom meeting so 73 have a fantastic uh, week and stay safe uh, and stay social distancing and all the all the stuff that we're being told so uh, so so yeah 73 uh, everyone <laughs>